Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Welcome back to Sunday Morning in the Old Cookbook Show. Today we're gonna do a mock apple pie. A couple of weeks ago, we did a vinegar pie and we sort of traced its history from the mid 1850s uh, down through the ages and through the Great Depression. And it's one of those pies, vinegar pie is one of those pies that when you say it, people say, oh yeah, it was invented during the Great Depression. When you say mock apple pie, um, you get that, oh, uh, it's from the Great Depression. It was invented during the Great Depression by Ritz crackers. It predates those. Again, mock apple pie goes back into the 1850s. And so today we're gonna do a recipe from 1857. Um, February 1857, it's from a newspaper in Indiana and it's attributed to a Quaker. So we're gonna start out. I've got dry breadcrumbs and this is water that's just boiled. I'm gonna do half of the recipe um, because I don't need two pies. I only need one pie. So in these early recipes, um, what we found with the vinegar pie was that it had an, an apple -y flavor. And I think the apple cider vinegar was bringing that apple -y flavor. This one doesn't have any vinegar or apple cider vinegar, but it has tartaric acid. So next in goes some white sugar. This is cane sugar. It is um, pure, su pure sucrose, so that gets mixed in, and then it calls for some butter. So a little bit of butter gets mixed in, and that butter should melt along with the hot water. Okay, the butter's melting in nicely. Now, um, one of the things that I see over and over and over again in the newspaper uh, recipes through the 1800s, early 1900s, is it says to make this recipe when apples are scarce. And, you know, living in 2023, apples available all the time. Um, because they're, you know, we're in the north, they're either coming in from the north uh, here during harvest time, or they're varieties that can be held almost forever in the correct storage. So, you know, an apple that was picked here in the fall we could still have that apple fresh and tasting fresh next fall when the new crop is coming in, or there's apples coming in from South America, South Africa, that sort of thing. 1850 is not quite the same. Um, they didn't always have some place to, to hold apples or keep apples long-term storage, especially if you're you know just moving into the West, which is where a lot of these recipes seem to come from, the sort of the Midwest, Northern Midwest, um, you might not have had the storage facilities, you might not have been able to plant an apple tree yet, you may not have access to apples all year round. And when I look at our recipe cookbook collection, um, this is the Cook Not Mad, published in 1831 in Watertown, New York. And I, I just went in, picked one from the early 1800s off the shelf, pulled it off, and of course, in this recipe book, um, just like I'm sure there are in most of the other ones from this time period, there is an apple pie using dried apples. So where we would keep apples today in cold storage, and I'm sure they did in this time period as well, um, in, a, in a root cellar or whatever, they would have also been using dried apples. Um, and so that's where this comes in. You may not have been able to get a dried apple. You may not have been able to get a fresh apple. So you're gonna get the next best thing. Um, next in is tartaric acid. When you get into the 1930s uh, with this recipe, you see cream of tartar. And cream of tartar is a derivative of tartaric acid. Tartaric acid is, uh, is the first product. And it was originally produced or a byproduct of the wine industry. Um, it's often described as uh, wine diamonds. It precipitates out of the wine when it's in storage in a barrel. And as you get later and later and later, um, they move away from tartaric acid. Which I get this at the grocery store. Very easy to come by today at the grocery store even. Um, they move to cream of tartar, which is again, a little bit easier to get. And by the time you reach the 1870s, you start to see lemons in the recipe, which kind of blows my mind because if you can't get apples, how are you getting lemons? And lemons are something that carries on into uh, the Great Depression. Next, it asks for nutmeg. And so I needed a fresh nutmeg today. Um, what I have here is 
a whole nutmeg that still has the aril on the outside. And what I mean by the aril is this uh, lacy covering on the outside. That aril is when you get, take it off and grind it, that is called mace. And so I've pulled off the mace and I'll leave that aside. What I'm left with is this nut. And inside this nut is the actual nutmeg. So I'll just put that on the counter and we'll give it a whack. The shell breaks off. And inside is the actual nutmeg. And I need to grate in half of this nutmeg. Um, this recipe follows a very similar trajectory to the vinegar pie um, in every respect. As the pie moves forward, it becomes more and more complicated. More things are added, extra spices are added. Um, it moves from leftover stale bread to crackers, like saltine crackers, then to Ritz crackers. And so Ritz comes on the scene and I, you know, just a pure marketing move. They figure out that they can push their crackers to make this pie and they put the recipe on all of their boxes. Okay, this, this seems pretty good. So this is supposed to cool down. And then the next thing we put in is a well-beaten egg. So, crack the egg. Give it a little bit of a beating. And then mix it in to the rest. And so I've already got the bottom crust rolled out. We'll roll out the top crust now. This is a two crust pie. Um, all right, so we'll get a little bit of flour out here on our bench. Got our pie dough. Uh, this is an all lard pie dough. You'll find the recipe elsewhere on our channel. And we'll just roll this out. So by the time we get to the 1930s, 1934, so you're in, we're in the Great Depression at that point. Um, it's it's very interesting because I I can't I can't reconcile some of today's popular storytelling around this pie and the Great Depression. I can't reconcile it with what I actually saw or see in the newspapers when I researched these recipes. And so in 1934, uh, an article comes up. It's sort of a viral article. It's, there are variations of the article in multiple uh, newspapers across the United States, written by a very famous at the time restaurateur who is doing a history um, of food and cooking over the previous 75 years at that point for um, A&P markets. And he talks specifically about how horrible mock apple pie from the 1850s. So he targets it right in. He's a food historian in this time period as well. He targets it right in and says that this pie is from the 1850s. And that, you know, it's a horrible pie that needs to stay in the 1850s. People need to forget about it. It's not something that anybody would want to eat or should eat. Okay, that is big enough. So I'll just kind of... Scoot that to the side a little bit. We'll bring our bottom crust in. We will pour in our filling. That is really sloppy. And round about center, I'm gonna cut a vent hole in the top because it's gonna need a vent hole, definitely. Set that aside. I've got a little bit of water here. And so I'll just go around the edge wet down the pie dough so that the top sticks. Um, I could have done a lattice top. Uh, for some reason, I thought I'd do a full top. I really like pie crust. I love baked pie crust. And so to that end, with the, uh, with the off cuts of what's left over today, um, I will be making pet de sur in an upcoming video with the off cuts from today's pie dough. So uh, keep an eye out for that one. So it's really simple at this point. I will just go around with a fork and seal the edge. And then I'll come back around with a knife and I'll clean up, cut off any of the excess. And we'll use that in our pet de sur. 
Now I've got the oven preheated to 450 degrees. I've got a pizza stone in the bottom and I've put in a baking tray in case it bubbles over. You never know. I'm gonna cook it at a really high temperature at the start to, uh, to get a nice bottom crust. I don't want a soggy bottom on this pie. So I've got it in a pie tin rather than a pie plate or uh, one of those glass pie dishes. Um, I find the combination of the metal bottom on a pizza stone, high heat, I get a really good bottom crust off the top. 15 minutes, I'll turn it down to about 350 and we'll bake it until it's done. Hey, Jules. Hey, Glenn. You're concentrating pretty hard there. Hey, friends. Ooh. Well, it didn't thicken. Didn't thicken. No, it looks a bit soupy. It it does. Um, but the crust is great, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, bring it fork. It's that's a strange texture. Yeah. Oh, good snap on the bottom crust. I like a good bottom crust. Okay, so it's... I want to say it's apple. Yeah. But the, the <laughs> apple texture isn't quite... It's like, a, it's like the mushiest apple pie ever. So it's... It's, it's breadcrumbs. An that apple. would explain the mesh mushy. Uh, well, where's the apple flavor come from? Um, the tartaric acid. Well, I should have known on the way. I didn't even look, right? You just wander on in. So the tartaric acid is bringing that apple flavor. Interesting. Just on its own. And, and um, is that just the sweet and the combination of the sweet and that? You're just tasting it? Yeah. Nice just, crystal, though. Just one crystal. Just take one crystal. I might take one crystal. Well, there's some stuff in my throat. Almost tastes l lemony. Yeah. And so later, later pies, later recipes for mock apple pie use lemon juice and lemon rind. Um, that's actually pretty good. If that was thicker, if the filling was thicker, that would really work. So do you make it? I don't know. I would. Two eggs instead of one. It only had one egg. And that one egg was supposed to thicken enough filling for two pies. So this leads me to a discussion about turnip. Yes. The, As you, a filler. The McDonald's. Well, and the fact that, that it takes on any flavor. So yeah. if you had, if you had uh, cooked some turnip, and put it in cubes and put that in there beforehand. Yes. Would it have given more texture to yes. it? Yes. Yes. In lieu the, of bread. The, the turnip. Or with bread. No, the turnip would work. Definitely. You could, you, so you could. I really know. I've never done it. I just know that turnip is a common filler for a lot of things because it takes on the flavor of okay, everything. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I had already been thinking about this. Okay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna actually. Eat more though. I, I am actually going to make a mock apple pie with the turnip because turnip, you would, turnip again, you probably may have it. It may hang around a little bit longer, um, and it's inexpensive, and I think the texture would be much closer to an apple mm -hmm. than 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 what's what's going on here. It's a pretty good pie, though. I, I know. Mean, so I mean, I'm having another bite. I'm trying really hard not to just so in, snap all the crust and eat it. I, I I put it up on on screen. This guy George Rector. Okay. Um, he's a restaurateur in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Very famous chef at the time. Mm. He does a series of articles for um, A and P mm. stores. Okay. For their 75th <clears throat> anniversary or whatever, and he talks about this pie being invented in the 1850s and that it should be left in the 1850s. It should be forgotten about that it's no good. I think it's actually pretty good. I mean, not bad. I mean, it's, it's not an apple pie. No. And I would, I would, I would. It is better than some of the other pies we've yes. had from this era. Yes, I would <laughs> cut back on the nutmeg and add cinnamon because I more closely associate cinnamon to apple pie than nutmeg. There you go. So that's part of that, that, that myth of the flavor is yeah. getting the right spices that, that suit you. Okay, so. Um, Mock apple pie from the 1850s. Uh, we will revisit this with turnip. Okay, Thanks I'm ready. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.